G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy. Day three has just come and gone in the trade period. And um, yeah, there's still not a lot of action. All the deals happened early on day one, from what I can gather. And uh, since then, we've just been drip fed little bits of information and thus I didn't do a proper trade update yesterday. So I sat down today to try and cover off all the little updates and we do have plenty of little updates. And there wasn't originally in this video going to be too much of a big story. However, about an hour ago, um, I noticed that The Age has reported that Dan Houston has more or less decided he wants to get to Collingwood. So in this video, we're gonna cover off about 15, 16 different players. And we're starting to get a feel for what deals might happen as early as tomorrow or today by the time you're watching this as well. So let's crack into it. So let's start with Dan Houston. I made a whole video about Dan Houston and going through each of the leading contenders for him. At the time, it was Carlton, Collingwood, and North Melbourne. And I sort of unpacked, you know, why each club was going for him and, and how they were going to potentially get it done. A lot of it, you know, centered around Gold Coast's first round pick. So you can still watch that. It's still not an irrelevant video. I'll leave a link to that in the top right corner of this video. Um, however, you know, as I said an hour ago, the age has reported that Houston wants to get to Collingwood. Doesn't specifically say, as far as I can tell, that he has, like, nominated Collingwood. However, it may be his preference. Uh, to be honest, I don't know to what extent this really moves the deal along. As I said in yesterday's video, uh, Port Adelaide still hold all the cards here in terms of whether they actually want to deal with Collingwood or Carlton, and well, I still don't know if I can see a reasonable trade getting done here for Dan Houston. So, so essentially swapping a future first for Gold Coast pick 13 this year, and essentially taking 23 off them for John Noble. I think that's the idea of what they're going to try and achieve in this trade. And I suppose 13, 23, and Joe Richards would be their best possible offer. I've also read a suggestion Collingwood would like to take 23 to the draft. So if it becomes Joe Richards 13, and I don't know, a later pick, I still just don't understand how Collingwood would expect Port Adelaide to accept that. I'm not saying it's impossible, but the logic doesn't add up to me here. You know, I do want to talk about some of the deals, um, you know, coming up, specifically around like, Rioli and Tom Barris and it's just interesting to compare what people are judging their values to be you know on the one hand we'll, we'll get to Rioli but you know Richmond wanting pick six and more for Rioli while Stan Houston the suggestion is that uh, Port Adelaide have to take pick 13 and some change I, I just don't really see how this is all going to play out so while it's possibly still considered a good outcome if um, for Collingwood if Houston wants to play there I'm not really too sure if this really nudges them too much further along in terms of getting a deal done here. It still doesn't quite add up to me. I did read a suggestion as well that Finley McRae uh, is potentially looking sideways at moving to another club this off season from Collingwood, just really seeking more opportunity in an opposition midfield perhaps, although there's no indication who that might be and probably wouldn't generate a lot in draft capital to be able to help Collingwood get Dan Houston onto their list. So we'll see what happens there, but Dan, the age is reporting that Dan Houston wants to play for Collingwood. Just a little quick note on Jack Graham, just passingly, uh, the only real update there is the paperwork's been lodged and Richmond received pick 42 so that is an update since the last time I made a video on either of my channels and um, you know that pick 42 could form part of a bid for getting pick 20 from the Brisbane Lions there's been a suggestion that they could offer a whole stack of second and third round picks I actually want to leave that to the end pick swaps but that is something that happened in the last 24 hours or so I did laugh there was a viral comment from a Richmond fan saying the list manager should be sacked at Richmond for not negotiating a better deal for Jack Graham obviously missing the point that it was a compensation pick. I just thought that was funny. North Melbourne didn't have a great day today in terms of updates, although nothing is really locked in. So obviously we just talked about Houston potentially wanting to go play for Collingwood. That dents their chances slightly, you'd say. Uh, you'd think North Melbourne, they need to win over Dan Houston to land him. They also had a trade offer for Luke Parker rejected, which raised my eyebrows a little that I'm thinking about it. So Sydney has reportedly rebuffed North Melbourne's initial offer of pick 62 for Luke Parker. The Swans are holding out for significantly more talk set to rumble on across the next few days. That's from Riley Beveridge. So a little bit interesting, um, just considering the age. So Jack Darling just obviously went to North Melbourne. That deal is finalized for pick 67. Luke Parker is the same age. I'm sure they were both taken in the 2010 draft. And I suppose you could absolutely say that it's not Sydney necessarily shopping him around. And I don't know if West Coast shopped around Darling, but that was certainly pretty open to it given list position. And Luke Parker is at the moment still a better player than Jack Darling. And he could be there, you know, to support and help Sydney still, you know, whereas Jack probably has less relative value to West Coast. But it's still interesting. Like normally when you see players who are 32 or older get swapped, you know, I, I really thought this would be cheap, but Sydney asking for significantly more. I don't know what significantly more looks like. 
I, mean, I know North have a pick in the 40s. Maybe they're ideally hoping to keep that, probably given the strength of this year's draft, but it may cost a little bit more than we anticipated for Luke Parker. Just a little tidbit on Jake Stringer as well. Again, I kind of suggested this might be the case, but Toomey is doubling down on the idea that Stringer wants to get to the Giants, and so does potentially Dylan Shield. We don't have a, a clear indication around Dylan Shield, but Stringer in particular uh, apparently wants to get to the Giants. So I'd imagine surely this deal gets done, and it could be wrapped up in a deal for Connor Stone, which there is no update for. However, with James Peatling, this was mildly interesting. Tom Morris is reporting that this deal could get done as early as today by the time you're watching this. So he's on a four-year deal from Adelaide, or at least that's what he's been offered, around $600,000 a year. So that's a pretty good payday for James Peatling, and I'd imagine probably a big factor in him wanting to leave the Giants. But it sounds like these negotiations are going pretty smoothly, and it looks like, according to Morris, a mixture of future second and third round picks. So what does that mean? Well, Adelaide probably give up a future second and probably upgrade GWS's third rounder to their own third rounder. So GWS get a little bit of an improvement in next year's third rounder uh, if you assume that GWS finishes higher than Adelaide, which is not guaranteed, but likely. This is a really good deal for Adelaide, I think. Um, Toomey suggested it would probably be a future second, and I said at the time that's good value. When you consider next year's draft is going to be heavily compromised, I don't know where that future second is going to land. So... It's a bit of bad luck there for the Giants, but it is also probably the only feasible thing Adelaide can offer to get a deal done because they've traded 28 for Neil Bullen. Let's talk about Richmond now. This is an interesting little subplot going on here. Dan Rioli. Apparently Richmond are demanding more than pick six. This is an interesting situation. It says it is on the table. The Tigers aren't happy with just pick six and want more than that. That's from Tom Morris as well. So this is an interesting discussion here because... Kane Corns has made an interesting point. He says, We have cried and sooked and moaned about Josh Battle giving secure to pick eight, but why aren't we talking about the fact that Rioli is 27 years old is being uh, considered worth pick six? I'm paraphrasing. Why is there not an outcry on this one? That would be the most irresponsible trade since Jack Bowes. Why is there no outcry? Well, one's generated by the AFL's um, objective system, and the other is one club offering way overs. So does he have a point? I think this is, it's nuanced to this particular situation. So at first, my first reaction to it was, wow, Richmond are kind of being dicks about this. And then I thought about it a little bit more and I was like, well, I have personally have on this channel expressed my concern about Richmond losing all these players at once and he's contracted. So they have every right to, uh, to ask more than he's actually worth. So it's true on the one hand that Richmond probably are just doing what's best for their footy club, and I can't really knock that, even if it is absurd if he gets more than pick six. So then it moves to Gold Coast. So Gold Coast being obscenely generous here. I suppose so. I have been one to criticize the Gold Coast Suns trading, and I'm not on my lonesome there. They have uh, produced some very, very interesting trade outcomes for their club. I think I've done a video on it in the past. This one is possibly a little bit different. I think the reality is... Gold Coast really don't place the same value on pick six as what other clubs will be doing. And part of that is because they have an academy that is currently churning out first round draft picks for them very easily. So they're going to have Lombard, who's probably a top six to eight talent in this year's draft, who they just simply need to match with points. Last year, they ended up with four first round picks. And apparently there's a bunch in next year's first round as well that will be Gold Coast Academy aligned players. So what value is pick six really to Gold Coast this year? It is an absurd outcome of pick six for Daniel Rioli with all due respect to the player. When you, as I said, you, you go back to the Dan Houston example and it's pick 13 and Joe Richards, like that does not add up at all. And to some extent, you, you just kind of have to deal with what clubs have. I realize that Collingwood would find it very hard to generate pick six. But I think what's happening there is Hardwick's come over there and said, let's cut the shit, stop going to the draft over and over again. And that's more or less sorted for them anyway. They don't really need to do too much in that space. They just have to wait for their academy kids to come to them to some extent. So pick six to them doesn't really hold that much value. Now, again, we're talking about pick six plus something. So if I'm Gold Coast, I probably do hold firm on that. Pick six and 13, for instance, would be absolutely absurd. Even though Richmond are equipped with a heap of points they could give Gold Coast. I think Gold Coast need to hold firm to some extent. Pick six for Rioli is generous, but maybe it is the best thing for their club. Pick six and 13 would be absurd unless they're getting a whole stack of points and probably future picks as well. As for Shea Bolton, this deal looks like it's moving along a little bit more smoothly. So Cal Toomey has said, Fremantle's put forward pick 10 and 18. I expect it to get done. So I do wonder as well, with the is there a compassion element here? I've talked about this before of Richmond accepting that Bolton 
does really need to get home to Perth because of, um, you know, changes in his family. I don't know. I think he's had kids recently. So maybe there's some underlying knowledge that, you know, Bolton really has to get home. So they're less willing to play hardball. Whereas Dan Rioli really has no similar motive for getting to the Gold Coast. He wants to play under Hardwick and the Suns and maybe there's family connections, but it's not quite the same thing, if that makes sense. So bottom line, Fremantle probably going to get this done fairly soon, I'd imagine, reading what Cal Toomey has said there. Peter Bell says, we've had a lot of discussions with Shea and hopefully that can come to fruition in the next week or so we have gone in with what we consider a very strong offer so yeah there you go 10 and 18 surely Richmond accept that at this point I don't think Fremantle would be silly enough to offer 10 and 11 on Tom Barris this deal looks like we could get done fairly soon so this is from Cal Toomey that Tom Barris is the one that could get moving in the next little bit the Baker and Barris moves look a little more isolated than the other big deals so yeah, what he means by that is it doesn't rely on other deals. I'd imagine probably the Barris deal has to happen before the Baker one. So that's probably where West Coast's attention is being at the moment. Equally, it's the only thing Hawthorne have on the agenda right now in terms of trades. So while it's not locked in that the pick 14 that comes from Hawthorne goes to Richmond, there are still some other options for those clubs to negotiate that deal independent of pick 14. I'm going to guess that the Barris deal happens fairly soon and then Liam Baker probably not long after that. A couple of players that look like they're probably going to find new homes as well. So Adam Tom Tomlinson um, is looking for a third home, according to Josh Gabalich, and Collingwood is a potential landing spot. So we knew that. However, there, it also suggests that the Saints are looking at him as are the Gold Coast Suns. I think it's a good move for Collingwood. They're also looking at Jack Hayes, who apparently has had a medical at Collingwood. So Hayes is a ruckman key forward, obviously, that played at St Kilda. And, um, you know, I think he had a pretty bright start to his career, did an ACL. And so Collingwood looking to shore up their key defensive and forward stocks, really, Nathan Murphy retired at the start of this year. They haven't had a real opportunity to replace him. So Tomlinson down back, Jack Hayes up forward. They're not you know, massive deals, but they are probably more money ball selections that just shore up some depth. On top of that, they're getting Harry Perryman and potentially Dan Houston. Again, we'll see what happens. Tom McGowan in next year's draft. If Collingwood can pull off Houston, it caps off an incredible trade period for a team that really had not much going into it. So I've grouped another little group of six players here that I want to talk about separately where these it's a little bit less clear to see what's going to happen here. So on the one hand, every player we've talked about so far is probably going to move clubs, whereas this group of players are more likely to stay. So we'll start with Caleb Daniel. Again, really capping off a bit of an unfortunate day for North Melbourne. The Parker thing is going to be more expensive. Houston wants to play for Collingwood. And now Caleb Daniel seems unlikely to leave the Western Bulldogs. So it says he's not expected to seek a move to North Melbourne unless the dogs open the door for him. Chivalry isn't dead. Daniel, who was contracted for another two years, has been weighing interest in moving to the Kangaroos, who have offered a longer-term deal to him. So we know that the Kangaroos were willing to extend his two-year contract to four to come play for North Melbourne. It says there was no indication from Caleb or his management that he wants to look elsewhere. Caleb is vice captain. I don't think I even knew that. And has two years left on his contract and a really valuable player. I can't really comment on this stage, said Sam Power, who is the Bulldogs list manager. So to be honest, there doesn't seem a lot of impetus for Daniel to want to leave. I think he's waiting to see if the Bulldogs kind of push him out. And that doesn't seem to be forthcoming. So that might end up with Caleb Daniel staying at the Western Bulldogs based on what we're hearing. Then there's a group of Carlton players here that were more or less told to explore their options. We know about Matt Elwes, Matt Kennedy, and Lewis Young. So I don't know if these players and their fates are intrinsically linked to the Dan Houston situation. It will be very interesting, but Always has not found a suitor yet, and that has come from Riley Beveridge. He says, spoke to Matt Bain, who was Always manager last night. He said the reports of his salary were wildly inaccurate and completely false. I did mention that myself in yesterday's Houston video. I saw a suggestion that Always wanted seven to $800,000 a year, and that's been quashed as fake news, um, which you know makes perfect sense. I feel silly that I even believed it, but at the same time, us and the broader football watching community were kind of unable to always tell what's bullshit and what's not. But it did raise my eyebrows. But either way, it sounds like Always hasn't really found a suitor yet. Now, I don't know, you know, if, if Carlton can get back ahead in the race for Dan Houston, could Always be part of a trade that gets to Port Adelaide? He has apparently been linked to them previously. But at this stage, it doesn't seem like he's necessarily going anywhere. Same thing with Matt Kennedy and Lewis Young, which surprised me a little bit. But according to Cal Toomey, Matt Kennedy, there is no taker at the moment. So he's likely to stay at Carlton where he's contracted. So there's no risk of he, him being delisted. But his motivations are potentially get to a club where he can get a little bit more time on ball. He's been pushed out of the midfield at times at Carlton. And he wants to stay in Melbourne because he's got a young family. So when you narrow those options down, it seems like there was no real suitor for him. Again, I would have thought Richmond would be a decent suggestion here, but alas, he's likely to stay. And Lewis Young as well surprised me because usually there's just a real market 
for you know low cost key position defenders and rucks at this time of year. So I thought Lewis Young would find somewhere. However, according to Cal Toomey, it looks like he's more likely to stay at Carlton at this stage. So a lot of questions still still to be answered there. Uh, Tim Membry we can talk about. Now he's been ruled out as an option for Carlton. To be honest, I even missed the fact that he was linked to Carlton. However, Riley Beveridge says he could get to another club as a delisted free agent. Josh Gablich says Tim Membry is still without a deal. You can't rule out that he will stay at the Saints. Carlton won't make a move for him. Okay, so we know that Carlton's not going to go for Tim Membry. I think North Melbourne had interest prior to Jack Darling. It probably seems overkill for them to double up on both. So how many options are there really here for Tim Membry to get to? I'm a little surprised that the Saints won't re-sign him. I would have thought there's still a number of clubs who could get value out of Membry. I mean, if SNN lose Jake Stringer, does Membry seem like a suitable option as a really cheap option? It won't cost them anything really to backfill that. I mean, Richmond, again, I'm, I'm going to keep mentioning Richmond as a team who could look at some cheaper players to pad out their best 22 while they hit the draft. But as it stands, it seems like Membry could well and truly absolutely stay at St Kilda. And I've seen a lot from Saints fans that suggest that they would like to keep Membry. So that, that one's a little bit of an eyebrow raiser. And finally, Riley Garcia has committed to the Western Bulldogs on a three-year deal. This one would have been another money ball kind of trade that I was kind of hoping my club, West Coast, would get in on. And West Coast was one of the teams that liked him. Port Adelaide had an offer as well. North Melbourne and the Sydney Swans. I didn't know the S Sydney were interested in Riley Garcia. All of those teams apparently came for Riley Garcia. He's committed to the Bulldogs on a three-year deal. So I think this is a good result for the Western Bulldogs. Again, we're talking about a lower cost and not necessarily massively high upside kind of player, but he's been playing really well in the VFL for them. And they're losing McRae and Smith. I think this is a good move for all parties, really. And I'm talking about Garcia and the Western Bulldogs, not so much West Coast. <laughs> and before we wrap up, I want to talk a little bit about some pick swaps that could happen. Uh, so we talked a lot about Gold Coast pick, but another one we'll throw in there is, is Fremantle's pick 11. So apparently there's a lot of offers coming in for pick 11. Um, you know, I've seen a suggestion that Fremantle want to hold a pick in this year's draft. That would make perfect sense to me. I've seen it suggested they're really interested in Bo Allen, but I don't know if that's lazy journalism associating the WA kid with the WA team. So there's that. On the other hand, we talked previously about how they might push a pick into the future to go for Chad Warner. If I was Fremantle, I'd probably hold on to the pick. We know that in 12 months' time, first of all, there's the, there's the possibility that Chad Warner doesn't go to Fremantle. This is the stronger draft. And there will be greater flexibility next year for teams to trade not only their future, but their future future picks. So if Fremantle are contemplating moving into next year's first round and completely being absent in this year's first round, it's something that's raising my eyebrows a little bit, but nonetheless, it's considered a possibility. And it could also be one of those Carlton, Collingwood, North Melbourne clubs who still want to get down Houston or just simply want to get into the first round of this year's draft. And we talked about this before with Richmond getting pick 42 now. Um, they're likely to get a deal done for Brisbane's pick 20. So Brisbane need points for Ashcroft. How many times have we said that over the last couple of years? Anyway, they've also got Sam Marshall as well, which is something to be considered. And they need points. They don't have enough at this current point in time. So I did wonder if Brisbane would trade out of next year's draft into this one if things got desperate. But the Tigers, and this is reading an article, a suggestion that they could send 32, 42, 43, 45 all for pick 20. And Richmond aren't going to need all those picks, so they can probably be a little bit generous there unless they do another deal with Gold Coast, which is also distinctly possible. But uh, that's probably Brisbane's avenue to getting more points for Ashcroft and Marshall. Richmond have placed themselves beautifully with all these future picks that they did last year. They're in a really good position to trade up to 20. So I think that's all I've got for you for the time being, guys. We'll see if there's any movement. Again, the Peatling deal could happen today. Um, Barris deal could potentially happen by the end of the week, I would have thought. The Dan Houston one, it'd be great to get some more info on that ASAP, although probably one that's going to go right to the wire. But I hope you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.